This is a production of PBS Charlotte. This week on Off the Record, get a shot, get a test, or get suspended. Hundreds of local workers who don't follow new COVID rules on the job wind up off the job. The state forces Union County schools to reverse their no quarantine policy, and black leaders meet with CMS to reverse their falling test scores. Also, a one-year-old girl wounded in another teen shootout. Gunfire between two moving cars on Independence Boulevard. A state court rejects North Carolina's new voter ID law. Was it just politics or racism? or maybe a little bit of both. And at Charlotte City Hall, looks like they're putting the brakes on a new tax for rapid transit until they can get the suburbs on board. Plus, is Charlotte's airport really busier now than it was before COVID? And the Charlotte artist gets the okay for his statue of Billy Graham at the U.S. Capitol. Lots to talk about next on PBS Charlotte. And from our PBS Charlotte studios in historic Plaza Midwood, I'm Jeff Sonier, and we're off the record talking about the stories you've been talking about this week. And if you watch the news, read the news, and listen to the news, well, you'll recognize the names and faces around our virtual table. Tony Messia from the Charlotte Ledger, Dedrick Russell from WBTV, and Mark Becker from WSOC-TV. You can also join the conversation at home. Just email your questions and comments to off the record at WTFI.org. Well, uh... A lot of different stories about a singular subject this week, and that is uh, employee groups, workforces at the county, at one of the local hospitals who are facing suspension because they are not following the COVID rules regarding either get a vax or get tested. Um, uh, we're talking about hundreds of employees, hundreds of employees that are off the job right now, uh, apparently without pay. And um, what happens next depends, I guess, on the employers and the employees themselves. Anybody want to take a first crack on what's happening in Mecklenburg County and also over at Novant? Well, let me jump in real quickly. Um, I think they knew this was coming, right? Yeah. I mean, you, you have a large percentage. I don't know, Novant's percentage is like 98% of the, the staff there have either complied with the vaccines or the testing that they're requiring if you're not vaccinated but there are always going to be some and and um, who aren't and and so novant and and i suspect the county i haven't spoken with the county folks but uh, they they had to know there would be a certain percentage who aren't and it's a business decision and they're they've made it and i would be surprised if they if they back down they may modify it slightly but i think they knew this was coming and you know it's 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 pretty tough yeah, I mean, I think Jeff, what we're what we are seeing, we're seeing more and more employers doing this. Obviously, you know, government employers want to want to be in the position of saying, "Listen, we're you know we're taking the lead, and we want people to follow our lead." But you know, the labor market is so tight. If you just had a few employers that were requiring this, and a bunch that weren't, people could just say, "Oh, forget this. I'm leaving. I'm going to find a new job. It's a good, you know, it's a good time to look for a job." You know, there's a lot of a lot of vacancies out there. But you know, as as we see more and more employers do this, that's going to get a little bit harder because they're kind of putting the squeeze on um, you know a lot of these workers who who just don't want to take the vaccine. Yeah, Dedrick. Yeah, and as Mark was saying, that people employers should have known this was going to come because after the vaccine has been approved now, um, so now employers are now saying, okay, then we have the science on our side that it has been approved. So now we have to, to make it work. And safety is the top priority because we have seen where hospitals have had to shut down um, 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 wards because of a COVID outbreak there inside hospitals. And then also um, hospital workers have, you know, um, sued and taken their employers to court, but, uh, but they have lost um, thinking that, um, that no employee should, no employer should be able to force us to take uh, on a vaccine, but uh, but we know down in Texas that um, that employees lost that case. So um, so it was bound to happen um, because at the end of the day, that people say that if you're vaccinated, that things will be better, and vaccination is the best way to um, to, to to stop out COVID nineteen. Yeah, let's uh, clarify. By the way, both policies, uh, Novant and. Um and the Mecklenburg County policy say if you can get the vaccine, we'd like that, but uh, if you don't get the vaccine, you do have to provide a weekly test, uh, a COVID test, and uh, the county in particular seems to be taking a particularly hard line on this. Here's a quote from um, 
from the county manager, uh, Dina DiOrio. She says uh, the employees who are in this situation have put themselves there. She's talking about those suspended employees who are uh, losing a, a, a week's uh, work without pay. And it seems to, it's unclear now on what happens next, both at uh, the hospital and at uh, Mecklenburg County. The, the rules say that if you don't comply for a second week, then uh, you go from suspension to uh, termination. So um, any sense of, uh, you know, whether this is a, I mean, every employee makes their own particular decision, but uh, nobody seems to be backing off on the importance of following those rules right now, these employers. Right, I think yeah. the, the, the county did revise, moderate a little bit their their uh, testing requirements, made it a little easier to get, to get uh, you know, meet those testing requirements. But I don't, I don't see them, backing down per se i mean i, I and, and i guess the real question is we're starting to see the numbers uh, the COVID numbers again going back down generally not just uh here but around the country and and one wonders if this has is partly uh due anyway to uh, these mandates being issued around uh, the country and, and here as well and more people getting vaccinated and that may be maybe helping to slow the numbers and if that's the case well then the employers are going to say look this is working but mm -hmm. we're, we're gonna we're gonna keep it up Dedrick? And, you know, rules are rules. Yeah. And, you know, and, and I can't help to think uh, that we're looking at business because I believe that when people are looking at where to do, bring um, conventions and where to bring, you know, gatherings, then I'm pretty sure that that is going to be at the top of the list. You know, how safe is the area where I'm going to bring hundreds of people potentially here to, to have a gathering. And so if, you know, if they see that the county is, um, is being hard on its rules, then that will give, um, um, calm some fears and saying that, hey, yes, that they have, um, have a gathering because we all do not want to go back to, um, to a year ago where things were shut down and conventions were canceled and things like that. And so therefore, you know, follow the money because, uh, mm -hmm. you know, money makes a difference. Yeah, and the county, again, clarifying, they're not forcing anyone to get a vaccine and they're not forcing employees to tell them if the COVID test was positive or negative. They're simply asking them to provide a weekly uh, test, not a test result, just proof that they've had uh, the actual test. A couple of other items uh, in this general area. Uh, the Charlotte Symphony now says that they will require ticket holders to their concerts also to provide the same thing, either a vaccination proof or a proof of a negative test coming into their concerts and at the state fair uh, they're not requiring vaccines but they are recommending and uh, encouraging vaccines so if you want that uh, deep fried Twinkie I guess uh, you know you don't have to you don't have to get <laughs> which is a greater threat to your <laughs> yeah, health I'm gonna say I'm not sure I'm not sure what's a, <laughs> what's gonna make you sicker first uh, but anyway those are the, those are some of the other uh, kind of COVID uh, uh, stories that have popped in the news this week uh, on the education front uh, uh, Union County Schools we're in the news last week, back in the news this week, uh, in that stalemate we talked about a week ago regarding the state uh, health department and their uh, no quarantine rules. Uh, Union County did finally back down with that uh, threat of, of legal pressure. Uh, Dedrick, you want to take this one first since you cover education for us? Yeah, I guess Dr. Mandy Coden, I guess she has juice. You know, she sent that letter <laughs> and um, and things changed. Um, it didn't take long. You know, um, and, and a lot of parents we have talked to um, and they're split. You know, you have some parents who backed the Union County Public Schools um, stance on, uh, on uh, eliminating the contact tracing and quarantine and things like that. And then you have other parents who said that, hey, I have a child who suffers from asthma. Or I have a child who has another um, health issue. And to, to, to put my child in that type of danger, that, um, that I don't think that that's right. And we had one parent who says that we need an adult in the room to figure out what is best. So, um, so I am. Um, uh, uh, someone has really, uh, you know, they, you know, reversed their standing, and people are pleased with that. But, uh, but I guess, just very, this all plays out. You know, is it politics or is it uh, education? You know, it, it's just, you know, it's just surprising to me how adults how they um, make decisions and they say it's on behalf of kids but the other people do not think that it's on behalf of kids. So it's just very interesting how, um, how people vote going forward. And I think that going forward when it comes to elections 
And when it comes to choosing your next school board member, I think that a lot of parents and a lot of voters are going to um, have more questions to ask before they for another person. Yeah. Uh, I think it took the board all of three minutes, right, to basically <laughs> convene and say, all right, never mind, we're going to you know, go back to doing this. And, and at the same time, it's three minutes and it's probably three years worth of fallout. Uh, when you talk about, uh, you know, as Dedrick already alluded to, the, the re-election and so forth. I mean, everything everything is political, particularly with the COVID, COVID uh, issue. And uh, yeah, it, uh, it, it, the, the, it, didn't, it didn't last long, the, 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 the face off there, but uh, still there's, there's a lot of stuff that will unravel in the next, you know, several months or so, I think. Dedrick, again? Yeah, and I wanted to bring up another point. You know, it's interesting, the Union County Commissioners, that when it was a vote to vote, to have a vote of confidence um, in the Union County School Board in the direction that the school board was going to, going in, there was no support to, to there were not enough um, votes on the Union County Commissioner Board to have a vote of confidence. That motion failed. So, uh, so, so Union County School Board is getting a lot of attention and, um, and, and, and it's split. And some people are saying hip, hip, hooray for the Union County School Board. And other people are saying, you know, what are you thinking, Union County School Board? So um, it just shows how split we are in our communities. Yeah, that uh, that step back that Union County took, by the way, wasn't a full step back. They did uh, they did go back to the quarantining of, of kids who uh, have close contact with uh, folks who are positive for COVID. But uh, they've shortened the quarantine time. I think originally it was what, uh, 14, 14 days. days. Now mm -hmm. it's down to seven to 10 days in Union County. And they're not doing contract tra contact tracing anymore. They're going to provide that information to the state and let the state handle contact tracing. So uh, again, Union County definitely doing things differently than a lot of other local school boards, although in, in Gaston County, they're also going to be considering a no mask policy again uh, next week on Monday. They're required to talk about it every time they take a vote once a month, but uh, Gaston County, that's on their agenda as well. Mark, you want to yeah. uh, well, I just wanted here? to say in, in their release explaining their, their decision, the Union County uh, schools underlined at the bottom of the release this is not changing our optional mask policy right so they're not changing that they're not backing off and going to a mask mandate uh, and they wanted to stress that essentially uh sort of saying yes we we cave on this one but you know we're not going to go to a mask mandate and they were very emphatic about that yeah um and while Union County schools uh, met to talk about their no quarantine policy, uh, CMS had a meeting of its own this time with uh, the local black political caucus talking not necessarily about COVID, but uh, about that uh, gap in achievement that COVID's kind of shined a light on, but that has been there present and uh, unfortunate for, for many years. Right, Dedrick? Absolutely. You know, they had a meeting on Tuesday. Um, CMS Superintendent Ernest Winston, um, school board chair Elise Dash. They um, broke down the plan for um, the Charlotte uh, Mecklenburg Black Political Caucus. Um, and they wanted to say that what they're going to do in order to help close that achievement gap. And they, right out the gate, they said they told um, the caucus that this eight year effort, that this is not going to close overnight. And they are aware and admit that these gaps before the pandemic and now the pandemic has made things worse. And so one of the questions the caucus is a multi-year effort, then what about that child sitting in who's supposed to graduate next year? Uh, what are you going to do about that child if this is a multi-year effort? And so the response was is that the superintendent says that effective teaching that shore up um, our efforts when it comes to teaching and give every teacher the tools and the resources that he or she that they need in order to help that child be successful in college and career ready by the end of this school year. And also, they also said that the board, they're going to be spending more time in tackling the achievement gap. Every time the board meets at a board meeting, at least 50% of meeting time will consist of tackling the achievement gap. So, and they're also going to partner with Council of Great City Schools to try to figure out what the district needs to do right now and in the years to 
make sure that things get better, make sure that little Johnny and little Susie, maybe they, they get the education that they need so they can be a productive citizen once they get that high school diploma. You know, and Jeff, if I could cut in, you know, the, the interesting thing here is you'll recall that back this summer, you know, that, that this, um, you know, this meeting with the Black Political Caucus and CMS, the, the background of that is, you recall, you know, this, this funding dispute that the county had with CMS, the Black Political Caucus and a lot of black leaders were kind of siding with the county on that, saying, listen, right. mm -hmm. CMS isn't doing enough to, to, um, to, to improve the outcomes uh, for, for students. And so, you know, it seems like now that they're maybe breaking bread and, and, and having those conversations, you know, maybe something productive can come of it, but certainly, you know, interesting to see that, you know, the politics of this after this summer, very contentious summer of, of how do we fund CMS and, and where do the different sides line? Up. Yeah. yeah, and I got reaction from the um, um, caucus chair, um, Stephanie Sneed, about her reaction after the meeting. And she told me that she is still looking for specifics from CMS, that she wasn't 100% <clears throat> pleased with CMS's presentation. And, you know, I asked, you know, is there a bright spot? You know, you know, is CMS doing all it can do? And so she told me that there will be no bright spot until um, the achievement gap has been closed. And CMS did promise that they would come back um, on a regular basis to, to, to give updates on what they're doing to see if it is working. And if it is not working, then they are, um, they promise that they will, you know, tweak and redo some things because they know that, um, that mm -hmm. time is of the essence. And also this week, ministers had a, a press conference as well. So, um, so everybody has to do their part in order to help um, students achieve. Mark, you want to wrap this up for us? Yeah, real quickly. Listen, this is long haul, right? I, and I think, I would hope uh, people who are pushing for this achievement gap to be closed, as they should, recognize that. It's not going to change overnight, but they're keeping the pressure on uh, just to make sure that the, the school board uh, doesn't forget uh, that, that they've got this issue. And, 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 but I don't think it's going to change in the next year. It's going to have to be several years. And as for that kid who's graduating next year, you just do the best you can, I think, with yeah. it, right? I mean... Yeah, back to just quickly to Tony's point, you know, uh, a lot of folks saw that as a win for the uh, school board when they weren't forced to come up with a plan to get their, their budget allocation this year. But uh, uh, ultimately, the pressure that was put on by the Black Political Caucus and county leaders apparently is having an effect in terms of, again, opening yeah. the doors, keeping the conversation going and letting them know that uh, this is something that uh, that is expected of them now, whether they get their funding or not. So um, good point there, Tony. Good discussion on this one. By the way, CMS, let's give credit where credit's due. Um, mask policy from day one, they've had uh, minimal, I don't, I don't want to say they've had none, but uh, compared to a lot of other school systems, they've done quite well in the COVID area. Not too many clusters, not a lot of infections, pretty much business as usual in the school in the school uh, every day, and that's good news for parents and kids and, and the community as a whole. So um, kudos to uh, our friends over at CMS for, for that. Um, uh, I know T CMS has dealt... Uh, from the beginning of this school year with teen violence. And uh, while this next story isn't necessarily CMS related, it's another example of, um, you know, what used to be such a foreign thing, that what used to be limited to movies and, you know, action scenes. This is real life now. Mark, what was what was going on on an Independence Boulevard this week? Well, you had a shootout between two yeah. uh, people in two cars. You had a 19-year-old driving with a 15-year-old in the car and a one-year-old child in the car, and another car pulls up alongside police, say, and they, they start shooting at each other. And uh, what, what's troubling here, of course, is that the one-year-old was, was uh. hit. And uh, was hit in the head, actually, and, and is in the hospital. I, I'm told, I spoke with her mother, and she'll be okay, but it was a serious situation. Now, at the same time, what is equally troubling, I think, is that you have a 19-year-old uh, who police say fired a shot that actually hurt that little girl, um, who is, by the way, his daughter, hmm. um, and a 15-year-old in the car who was also hit but police say he was also shooting. So you mm. talk about the schools and the violence, and Sorry. and I don't know this 15-year-old or where he, but he's presumably in school somewhere. And you know, police have talked about this violence in the schools, and we just had our fifth gun found at West Charlotte High School since the school year began. And and you talk about the guns being turning up at schools, and then what happens is these these fights in schools spill over to the community. And you had that three-year-old boy killed yeah. a couple weeks ago by something that had started with a school fight. So it all is connected. You can't separate schools from the communities and the teenagers and the guns. And yes, we got a problem. And it's a cultural shift. I mean, we've talked about this before. 
I don't know how you can, uh, I don't know how you change the culture that leads people in this direction in the first place, right, Dedrick? Yeah, it does. And, you know, I had a conversation with, um, with two seniors, two CMS seniors, and they told me that because of the, they believe that because of the remote learning and, um, and students not being in school, that this led to um, a, a rise in students um, not having things to do and maybe possibly joining gangs. And um, since there were no after school programs and students weren't in school, that they believe that some of the people that they know, um, that that gave them opportunity to, to, to associate with people who were heading down the wrong path. And they believe that that's one of the reasons why when now when everybody's back together again, things that they were doing and who they associated with while school was out, now it's, it, it, it's playing out because they are just now associating themselves with, um, with, with the people who are up to no good. Yeah, it's one of those stories we keep talking about. We wish we didn't have to keep talking about, but uh, as long as it's there, it's hard to ignore. And um, you just wonder when do we hit that tipping point that we talk about a lot where, you know, everybody gets uh, uh, concerned enough to, you know, to, to move that culture or change those minds. But um, yeah, sad story this week and uh, sad uh, story overall, I suppose. Uh, at City Hall, transit tax uh, kind of on the back burner right now. Um, uh, Tony, you talked with uh, the uh, Mayor Pro Tem about what I guess you could consider a delay in uh, moving forward on this particular thing for now at least. Yeah, I mean, you'll recall the, the timeline of this, you know, the Gantt committee, the former Mayor Harvey Gantt chaired this commission looking at how do we get more transit? How do we get more you know, sidewalks, bike lanes? They came out last December and said, okay, here's the way to do it. You, you increase the sales tax by one percentage point. You put it on the ballot in 2021. Uh, you know, they had cost estimates at the time. It was $8 billion, $8 billion to $12 billion. Uh, And they said, okay, here, here's how you accomplish it. Problem was they roll that out and now now things are getting pushed back a little bit. You know, you had some pushback from those northern towns. Um, you know, there's some machinations in Raleigh. How do we get this on the ballot going through Raleigh? And now, you know, when you talk to city leaders now, they say they don't have a timeline. You know, I think they would like to get it on the ballot in 2022, but they haven't really approached Raleigh. I talked to Senator Phil Berger's office, the majority uh, or the, the Senate leader. He said they haven't really put forth a lobbying effort. And so it seems like they're kind of regrouping a little bit, working with regional partners, work, working with these other counties that also have interests in you know, uh, bus rapid transit and other things like that, trying to get them on board. And then so, well, they've been trying to build support. They had an economic development uh, study that said you know, exactly how much this will help the region. So they're, they're regrouping, I think, a little bit. And you know, it's been a little bit delayed. And so we'll see what that timeline winds up being, but it's certainly nowhere close. Yeah, you do get the sense that they did not anticipate the pushback that they are getting now and having to deal with now, right? Yeah, I mean, I think that's part of it, you know, is that, you know, the northern towns feel as though what's in it for us. We're going to yeah. increase our sales taxes and we're not going to see any benefit because Norfolk Southern won't let the uh, the, the rail line be used, you know, to, to reach Huntersville and Davidson and Cornelius. I mean, I, there's a lot of questions about that. And I think they're, frankly, under the surface, I think there are some political realities too. And the, Mecklenburg County is pretty solidly democratic. Something like 16 out of 17 members of the state yeah. legislative delegation are Democrats. The city council, county commission, dominated by Democrats <clears throat> overwhelmingly, but the people making the decisions in Raleigh are all Republicans. And so yeah. while they all talk a very nice game, there's this reality of why should we help these Democrats in Mecklenburg County yeah. uh, tax people. So, you know, there's there's some of that too, I think, which you don't really hear a lot about, but I think it's there. Another transportation story coming out of the city this week. Uh Good news, I guess, out at the airport with uh, with uh, passenger numbers back to where they were pre-COVID. Good news, I guess, unless you're flying. I know, uh, Mark, you just got back from some air travel. Uh, what's it like out at Douglas Airport versus other airports? It's busy. It's busy. I mean, and I'm, you know, I don't want to brag here, but I've, I've traveled some of the bigger airports in 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 uh, the country and and actually overseas. And Charlotte's airport, again, we're in a kind of a, a special position here because a lot of our flights are short haul flights, right? You know, connections domestically. The the international travel, the U.S. just opened up international travel to vaccinated uh, foreigners like in, in, in Europe. So the international travel, those, those numbers of flights have gone way down. But we're flying from here to, you know, Louisville, Kentucky and to Kansas City and to Phoenix. And, you know, those flights are going and planes are full. The airport here is full. And I was in, at O'Hare Airport a few months ago, and 
it was just one day or two, but it wasn't as busy as Charlotte was. Now, obviously, they were a bigger airport, but um, yeah, we're busy. Dedrick? Yeah, and you know, a, a good airport, and that's what leaders want because a lot of people, they choose and pick and choose business if there's a good, um, vibrant and a good, uh, you know, easy, accessible airport. And so, you know, um, leaders are probably saying, yes, we want a busy airport because a busy airport um, equals to them, you know, more business and, and more eyes on um, on Charlotte as people make their connections and things like that. So, um, so, so, so busy is good. And hopefully busy will translate into more business um, coming to, to Charlotte and people I mean, to Charlotte, maybe our airport could be the, the place where they can say, hey, um, let's do business with Charlotte. Yeah, busy is good unless you're in line uh, <laughs> to get through security, I suppose. They're not so good. Just get there two to three hours early, right? Yeah. yeah. Hey, as usual, out of time uh, before we're out of topics, a couple things. The voter ID law that was uh, nixed by the courts this week, the legislature goes back to the drawing board on that. So that's a, another topic that we'll talk about again, probably in the not too distant future. And the Billy Graham statue um, replacing the statue of former Governor um, Charles Aycock in the, in the uh, U.S. Capitol. That design was approved this week. Uh, Charlotte artist is uh, doing the statue. Uh, Billy Graham will be holding a Bible on one hand. There'll be Bible verses on the base of the statue, but uh, another uh, a local um, uh, hero, I guess you'd say, icon, if you will, will be part of that uh, hall of statues uh, at the U.S. Capitol very soon. We're out of time, folks. Uh, again, good discussion. Thanks, gang, for uh, joining us this week at home. Always thank you for being with us. And if you want to comment on what we talked about today, uh, good or bad, send those comments or questions to Off the Record at WTV .org. Again, appreciate you being here this week, and we'll see you next time on Off the Record. A production of PBS Charlotte.